In this video, we'll be going over the best feats, just generally the best ones in all situations, but mainly combat because that's what people care most about when it comes to the best feats. And at number 10, we have Observant, a feat that's not actually super useful in combat at all. Observant gives you a total of three benefits. One of them is an ASI increase, where you can choose to increase your intelligence or wisdom by one, which already makes it a great choice as a feat if you just want to take it for a half feat for its stats. It also has a pretty niche use, where it allows you to read people's lips, as long as they're speaking a language that you can understand. And then finally, it gives you a plus five bonus to your passive perception and passive investigation scores. Now, passive scores are a thing in the official rules, but mostly people only ever care about passive perception. As passive perception is probably one of the most used skills in the game, and getting a plus five bonus to that is huge. So, what exactly is passive perception used for? Well, passive perception is what determines if your character notices secret trap doors, traps, enemy parties while traveling, and is the number enemies have to beat if they want to sneak up on you. If you have a high enough passive perception, you can't really fall for traps inside of a dungeon, and you'll pretty much always notice secret doors, if you're just walking through it normally. It's an incredibly overpowered stat to have a high stat of, and it can completely trivialize a lot of official content. So, with a plus five, Assuming the character who has Observant has a Wisdom score of 20, this one feat would allow them to have a passive perception of 20. And a 20 passive perception basically makes you immune to most traps and ambushes in the game. Or at least in official content, I play a lot of Wizards of the Coast modules and Adventures League documents, and the only thing that a passive perception of 20 wouldn't help you with is in some of those tier 4 dungeons that are meant for, you know, around level 17 and up players. Although that's assuming no proficiency in perception. Once you add your proficiency bonus, if you take one of the many ways to gain proficiency in perception, this could allow it to go up to crazy levels of passive perception. On the most extreme example, if you're a tier 4 party, you'll have a proficiency bonus of plus 6, so with Observant and a 20 Wisdom, that's 26 passive perception. And if you're an expert in it, that's 32 passive perception. Basically, if you really want to piss off the DM and completely trivialize all other dungeons, this is the skill to pick. Because you know a feat is powerful if it's strong enough to annoy a DM. Because also, remember, when you perform a stealth roll, all you have to do is roll higher than your enemy's passive perceptions. And if you have an incredibly high passive perception, that can be very difficult for anything to sneak up on your party. Although the reason this skill is at number 10 is because this feat is not useful in combat. A plus 5 to a really good out of combat skill is amazing, but it won't help you do more damage, well besides the point to your indoor wisdom. I will say though, the ability to read lips has come in handy at quite a few occasions where a couple of the players who have taken this skill in some of my games. So even that part of the feat is good. And the rest of it, it just barely makes it to the top 10 list when compared to some of the probably overpowered ones that are going to be at the higher spots on this video. And at number 9, we have Alert. This is another one like Observant where it gives you a really powerful bonus to a pretty useful skill. This time, a plus 5 bonus to your initiative. You also gain the ability to not be surprised while you're conscious, and makes it so creatures can't gain advantage on attack rolls against you if you can't see them. Which means invisible targets don't gain advantage when they battle you. Now, at first glance, it might seem like the reason this one's on this list is for that plus 5 to initiative. But really, the powerful feature about this feat is the ability to not be surprised. Losing the first round of combat because you're surprised can be devastating in some situations. I personally lost a character due to a surprise round, and as long as you're not asleep, this feat will prevent that from happening. This is another one of those where it's super annoying to a DM if a player has this feat, which of course means it's a really good feat to have. But also we round back to that plus 5 to initiative. This can make sure you go first in the initiative order pretty frequently, if not all the time. And if your entire party has the alert feat, they'll basically all go before any of your enemies can because none of them can roll as high as someone with alert. I remember running an epic level campaign where basically everyone had this feat, and most of the bosses would be at half health by the time they took their first round in combat, while already out of legendary resistances. And as long as a single person has alert in your party, it's very easy for them to just warn everyone else if you're about to be surprised. That way you really don't have to worry about surprise rounds as long as at least one person has alert. Although I should mention this isn't guaranteed that the rest of the party can't be snuck up on. If your DM has a group sneak up on you by coming out of the ground or jumping off the walls right next to you, you wouldn't reasonably have enough time to alert the rest of your party to avoid all of them being surprised. As based on the rules of surprise, 
It is possible for some party members to not be surprised while others are during that first round of combat. Now, unlike Observant, Alert does have some combat uses because of the plus 5 bonus to initiative, which is why it takes a slightly higher spot, although both of these feats kind of serve a similar purpose. So, you want to not be surprised by something and have a combat bonus? Then Alert is the one to take. Although, if you want to be incredibly useful outside of combat, and want to increase your Wisdom or Intelligence score by 1, then Observant is the better choice. And at number 8, we have Magic Initiate. This is a feat that allows non-spellcasters to learn how to cast 3 spells, 2 cantrips and 1 first level spell. But there are some restrictions to the spell. You can only pick spells from a single class, so you have to pick which of the spellcasting classes you want to choose, and then you're only allowed to pick your 2 cantrip spells from that class's list of spells. And the first level spell you pick has an extra feature to it, where you're able to cast it at least one time per day without having to use a spell slot. Which basically means a non-spellcaster gets to use it, and a spellcaster gets an extra use of it. And if you're a non-spellcaster, the best spell to pick for this feat is the Find Familiar spell. This is just kind of the best level 1 spell to cast if you can only cast a single spell per day. As it gives you a familiar that doesn't have a duration, so you just keep it as long as you're able to keep it alive. And has a whole bunch of combat and exploration utility, as long as you pick the owl as your companion. During combat, you can have the owl go in and give you the help action and then fly out without getting hit thanks to its flyby ability, which will give you advantage on your attack if you're able to control the familiar before you're around in combat, or to give advantage to someone else. Either way, you're using the owl to give advantage to something which is useful. It's also really useful for scouting out ahead, as the owl has a bonus to its stealth score, has keen hearing and sight, which gives it advantage on most of its perception checks, and of course has the ability to fly, which means it's real easy to keep it out of danger because flying is really good in D&D. And then of course for your two cantrips, you can just take two of the really useful wizard cantrips, like prestidigitation or firebolt if you want damage. Doesn't really matter, but if you want to pick the best cantrips, I would suggest watching my video on the top 10 best cantrips, or maybe the video on the top 10 best level 1 spells. Both of those very good videos to watch if you choose to take Magic Initiate. And Magic Initiate is taken a lot because having access to one spell per day is just incredibly useful in a whole bunch of different classes. Even if you don't take it in order to pick Find Familiar, sometimes just having an extra use of shield for that plus 5 AC bonus can be pretty useful, or picking up healing words so you can always have access to an emergency healing in case a party member goes down, and etc etc. And at number 7, we have Polar Master. This is a feat which only works while you're wielding one of the four polearm-like weapons, where it has two benefits to it. The first one is it allows you to use your bonus action to attack with a polearm by using the opposite end of it after you've attacked normally with it. This extra attack is only a d4 for its damage dice though, and only deals bludgeoning damage, which basically means it hits about as hard as a dagger. Although it still gains all of your other bonuses to it, so when you add in your ability modifiers and special properties of the weapon and proficiencies, it's a pretty nice extra attack, especially at lower tiers of play where martial classes don't really have a way to use their bonus action to deal damage most of the time. And the other ability of this feat makes it so when you have a polearm, it increases the range of your opportunity attacks to the range of that weapon. And the reach of most polearms is about 10 feet. So this makes Polar Master incredibly good for a tank-like character to have, if they combine it with another feat called Sentinel, which has the effect that if you hit someone with an opportunity attack, their speed is reduced to zero for the rest of that turn. So Polar Master can basically allow you to stop creatures from going into the back line to attack a squishy spellcast or a ranger. And this is mainly why Polar Master is taken, to be comboed with Sentinel. And with the amazing reach, Polar Master is really easy to almost always get off an opportunity attack with this combo, while also getting extra damage in the early tiers of play thanks to that bonus action attack it gives you. And the only reason I have Polar Mastery not towards the top of this list, even though it's a very often taken feat, is because on its own, it's not really as strong as a lot of the higher spots. And it's mainly comboed with another feat in order to reach its full potential anyway. But on its own, it's still good enough to make the list, if only at the number 7 spot. And at number 6, we have Crossbow Expert. This feat has three beneficial features of it. One of it allows you to ignore the loading qualities of a crossbow if you're proficient with them, which basically means you're able to multi-attack with them. It allows you to not have disadvantage with the ranged attack rolls if a hostile creature is within 5 feet of you, and if you use your attack action with a one-handed weapon, you can use your bonus action to attack with a hand crossbow you are holding. So just like with Polar Master, it gives you a bonus action attack, and a hand crossbow hits for 1d6 damage, so they're not half bad. 
And just like with Polar Master, Crossbow Expert gives classes who focus on ranged attacks a bonus action attack at early levels, which is incredibly powerful if combo with Sharpshooter, which can allow you to add 10 extra damage to your ranged attacks. In fact, the Crossbow Expert Sharpshooter combo is probably one of the highest damage dealing things you can do in tier 1 levels of play, if you have a way to gain 2 feats early. And most people who use bows will try to get these two feats anyway. Now, there is some complications with this feat and the bonus action attack, since even though you ignore the loading properties of a weapon, you still need a free hand in order to put the ammunition into the weapon in the first place. So you can't just dual wield two hand crossbows. Well, you can, but you'll only be able to fire them once before you have to drop one of them in order to reload. The loading property is different from the ammo property, and the ammunition rule specifically states that you need a free hand in order to load a weapon. So, what you could do is just have like a whole bunch of hand crossbows already preloaded in a bag of holding, and then just keep pulling them out so that you can dual wield that way. Otherwise, you only get this bonus action one time a fight normally, unless you drop the weapon in your other hand in order to reload, and then use your one free item interaction to pick it back up. Or if you ask your DM really nicely to allow you to do it and ignore the ammunition rules. And Crossbow Expert is one of the most commonly picked up feats on characters who use ranged attack rolls but not for its ability to bonus action attack with the crossbow. It's actually the second part of the effect that's super useful, because you see, it doesn't specify that it only works with crossbows. So having crossbow expert makes it so any ranged attack roll doesn't have disadvantage if there's a hostile creature in front of you, which means you can use this in order to not have disadvantage on spell attack rolls if you're trying to attack them in melee. And there are some classes that like to get into melee with their spells and attack rolls, so, Crossbow Expert is commonly taken if they don't want to have disadvantage on any of those roles. Because of that effect, Crossbow Expert is just a useful skill to have on pretty much any class that specializes in ranged attack roles, regardless if you ever use a crossbow or not. And at number 5, we have Elven Accuracy. This is a feat that can only be taken by Elves or have Elves, and gives you two benefits. One of them is an ability score increase for one of your four different ASIs. Basically anything except Constitution or Strength. Then it has another one, where if you have advantage on an attack roll that uses Dexterity, Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma, you're allowed to reroll one of those dice once. Now, what this means is normally when you have an attack with advantage, you're able to roll two dice to then pick whichever one is higher. With Elven Accuracy, you then pick the lower of those two rolls and then reroll it, which essentially allows you to have super advantage, as you're able to roll three separate dice in order to pick the highest, rather than two. So if you really want to hit someone with an attack roll that uses one of those four ability scores as a modifier, Elven Accuracy is definitely going to help you hit stuff. In fact, Elven Accuracy is commonly banned in most games, because of its supposed overpoweredness with the ability to increase your chance to hit. Even though, if you do the math, it only provides about a 10% extra chance to hit. For example, if you only need to roll a 10 in order to hit a target, you have a 55% chance of rolling a 10 or higher. With Advantage, you have an 80% chance, and with Super Advantage provided by Elven Accuracy, then you have a 91% chance, which is only 11% more to that advantage. It does still increase your chance to hit for sure, but it's not as drastic since you already have a higher chance to hit because of the advantage itself. But this really comes into play when you're trying to min-max the numbers, and the fact that it gives you more chances to crit. Normally, you only crit on a roll of 20, and some classes, like the Fighter Champion, can crit when they roll an 18 to 20. So being able to roll 3 dice and then pick whichever one crit is the best way to use Elven Accuracy. Because with Elven Accuracy and playing a Fighter Champion, your chance to crit from Advantage goes from 25% to almost 50%. So if you want to maximize your ability to crit, you definitely want to take Elven Accuracy, assuming you have a way to reliably gain advantage. Otherwise, normally it only increases your chance to hit by about 10%, which is like having an extra plus 2 to your attack roll, whereas having advantage is like having a plus 5. Still a strong feat, don't get me wrong, just not so strong that it's ban worthy like a lot of DMs do with it. And at number 4, we have Warcaster. Funny enough, this is probably one of the most picked feats in the game, where what this does is you can only pick this if you have the ability to cast at least one spell. Then, it gives you advantage on constitution saves to maintain concentration, which is excellent for any class that regularly uses concentration spells, which is a lot of spellcasters. It allows you to perform the somatic components to spells even if you have a weapon or shield in both of your hands, 
and it allows you to cast spells if a creature provokes an attack of opportunity from you, as long as the spell has a casting time of one action and only targets one creature. And Warcaster is comboed very well with Crossbow Expert, so that you can blast him with a ranged attack in melee range. Or if you're playing some kind of battle mage, you could use spells like Booming Blade, or just use a touch range spell like Shock and Grasp, or Inflict Wounds. This is an excellent way to be able to cast spells outside of your turn. So, part of the reason this feat is so commonly taken is because all three of its features are incredibly useful. Being able to gain advantage on concentration saves is huge. Because remember with constitution saves, if you're concentrating on a spell and you have to perform one of the saves if you take damage, the DC of that is 10 or half the damage, whichever is higher. So most of the time you're trying to beat a constitution save of a DC 10, and having advantage on that saving throw gives you about an 80% chance to pass it. Whereas normally, you only have a 55% chance, assuming no other constitution modifiers. Which is usually not the case, it's usually higher than that. Also, being able to actually cast spells while holding a weapon or shield is useful for a whole bunch of classes, not just battle mage-like characters. Like a cleric who wants to hold a shield, or a paladin or something, because you do need a free hand in order to perform somatic components, and a lot of spells have a somatic component. It basically means just like waving your hand in order to do whatever the spell requires of it. Otherwise, if you want to cast a spell and your hands are occupied, you can basically only perform verbal component-only spells. And there aren't a lot of spells which only have verbal components. Most of them have a cinematic component as well. And of course, being able to use spells outside of your turn with your opportunity attack is huge. Even if you're limited to only spells that target one creature, this can let you use stuff like Inflict Wounds, which is one of the hardest hitting level 1 spells and has a touch range. This could turn your cleric into one of the highest damage dealers in the group at early tiers, assuming you get off that one attack of opportunity. Basically, if you cast spells, this is a great feat to take, as it kind of covers all the bases depending on what kind of spellcaster you are. If all you care about, though, is the ability to have advantage on constitution saves for your concentration, and you don't think you'll ever use the other two features, then instead you could take the resilient feat and just pick constitution which will give you proficiency in that saving throw. Although even then, you can double up with Resilient Constitution and Warcaster to make it so you're both proficient in constitution saves and have advantage on them for their concentration checks. And at number three, we have Sentinel. This is a really good feat to take on frontline fighters if you want to make sure you stop creatures from trying to go to the backline or just move away from you. What it does is if you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, that creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. This isn't a grapple that they can escape from either, they just lose the rest of their movement. Also, if the creature tries to disengage to run away from you, you can still use a reaction for an opportunity attack, as with this feat you can just now ignore the disengage action, which is kind of huge. With Sentinel, creatures literally cannot get away from you without getting a chance to attack them, unless they teleport or something. And also, if a creature within 5 feet of you attacks a different target other than you, you can use a reaction in order to attack them. So if an opponent stays close to you and attacks anyone but yourself, It'll basically make sure your reaction is always used for some kind of attack. With Sentinel, your reaction is almost never going to go to waste, and it's even more deadly if comboed with Polar Master, which increases your reaction range to 10 feet. And it can also be comboed with Warcaster in order to cast spells and reduce their speed to zero. This is incredibly good, especially if comboed with Polar Master, to just shut down anyone from running away or to stop creatures from running into your backline. And there's lots of rounds in which martial classes will probably never use the reaction. But with Sentinel, you're almost always guaranteed to attack something with it. Which is why it's incredibly good, and super annoying for DMs if a character has this feat, and they're fighting an important NPC that you want to get away. It's really hard for a creature to run away from someone with Sentinel, unless you just straight up teleport, or incapacitate them first. And at number 2, we have a dual spot, with Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master. Both of these feats kinda do the same thing, so I thought I would just combine them together. Sharpshooter has three benefits to it. One of them is you don't have disadvantage on attacks that are made at long range. Your weapon attacks also ignore all but full cover. And if you're going to make a ranged weapon attack with something that you're proficient with, you can choose to take a minus five penalty to the attack roll in order to deal 10 more damage. And this ability is not once per turn or require any kind of resource. So you can just add this 10 extra damage to all of your attacks which is super deadly at early levels, where the average damage a person can put out in one turn, if optimized and rested, is around 10. Especially if combo with something like Crossbow Expert and getting two sharpshooter attacks per turn. Now, Great Weapon Master has two benefits. One of them is pretty niche, where if you score a critical hit or reduce a creature to zero hit points with an attack, 
you can then make a melee weapon attack as your bonus action. And its other effect is if you're going to make a melee attack with a heavy weapon that you're proficient with, you can choose to take a minus 5 penalty to the attack roll in order to add 10 damage to that attack. Assuming it lands, of course. So, it's exactly like Sharpshooter, except it can only be used on weapons with a heavy property, and set a Sharpshooter which can be used on any ranged weapon attack. Now, both of these feats are excellent, some of the best feats you can take on a character who has a melee weapon or a ranged weapon, because having a plus 10 damage to your attacks is kind of overpowered. Even at high tier levels of play, when your chance to hit is so high that a minus 5 penalty is almost negligible, just having an extra 10 damage to all your multi-hits is just going to add up over time. So the downside to these two feats is supposed to be that minus 5 penalty, which is technically a 25% less chance to hit. But a lot of builds can just increase their chance to hit through a whole bunch of skills they take anyway, and some classes can just give themselves advantage. And if you have elven accuracy in addition to that, then the minus 5 penalty is not really a big deal. Like an 11th level samurai fighter, for example, they have an ability to use their bonus action to give them advantage on all their attack rolls. So, if they attack with their turn and they use action search to attack again, having great weapon master or sharpshooter would allow them to deal 60 extra damage that turn with all those multiple attacks, all at advantage. And no other feat can really give them that much extra damage. Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter are so much better than all the other feats when it comes to increasing your damage that it seems kind of intentional in order to allow them to keep up with spellcasters, who are absolutely bongers at higher levels. A high level spellcaster can kind of win any encounter by themselves because of just how versatile those high level spells can be. So if these two feats are so overpowered, how could anything possibly beat them at the number one spot? And at number one, we have Lucky. Lucky is a feat which gives you three luck points. And whenever basically something happens that requires you to roll a d20, you can spend one of your luck points after the dice is rolled, but before you know the result, in order to roll an additional d20, and then choose one of those dice to use for that roll. Although it's not every single d20, it works on attack rolls, ability checks, saving throws, or attack rolls made against you. You can spend a luck point in order to make it so your opponent has a lower chance to hit you. And here's the thing with the luck points. It doesn't just allow you to re-roll the dice. It allows you to roll an additional one and then choose whichever of those 2d20s you want to use. So, you can use Lucky to basically give yourself advantage in all but name, which is a distinction that matters for certain things like being able to use Elven Accuracy. If you use Lucky on one of your attack rolls, you basically have advantage because you're rolling 2d20s, but you don't technically have advantage, so you wouldn't be able to activate the features of Elven Accuracy for example. And here's one other thing about Lucky that is completely broken. If you have disadvantage on a roll, that means you roll 2d20s and then pick whichever is the lower the result. But if you then use the Lucky feat on this disadvantage roll, it will allow you to roll an additional d20 and then pick any of the three results of the dice that you want, which turns disadvantage into super elven accuracy advantage, as you don't have to pick the lowest of the three results. You can pick any of them. This actually makes it so you can use disadvantage to your advantage by intentionally having disadvantage on attack roll, like maybe attacking with a ranged attack in melee, so that you can have a super advantage on instead if you use a luck point. And this is an intended use of lucky, and it's even confirmed in a sage advice as shown by this tweet that I'll have on screen. They justify it by saying that luck shines in those who are at a disadvantage, so it's an intentional design choice. The only downside to using lucky on disadvantage like this is that you still technically have disadvantage on that attack, which means you won't be able to activate stuff like sneak attack or other features that don't work if you have disadvantage. So, you can kind of see why Lucky is number one on this list. This feat is kind of broken, and is commonly banned in a whole bunch of games because of how strong it is. In fact, Lucky and Elven Accuracy are two of the most commonly banned feats at home games, even though Elven Accuracy isn't anywhere near as overpowered as Lucky is. It allows you to turn disadvantage into super advantage, it allows you to have a chance to succeed at very important roles, and it allows you to impose disadvantage on your opponents by forcing them to pick one of two bad results. So it basically does it all. It's an excellent tool for out of combat, it's an excellent tool in combat, it's great if you want to survive a saving throw, or to make an attack have a lower chance of hitting you. There isn't really a class where Lucky is bad on, and it kind of just makes everyone better if you do have it. And since it's so universally good at everything, especially since it gives you three luck points at that, it would still be good even if you only had one luck point per day. 
that it kind of easily takes number one spot on this list. Or I guess not easily, because Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master are both really good as well. The top two spots are three of the best feats in the game. All right, and that's the list. If you want to see which is the worst feats in the game, I would highly suggest watching the video on that. And of course, the video on the best spells for cantrips and level one spells for Magic Initiate. All of that will be linked at the end of the video.